Hello there. Welcome to Fireside with Peter Adkinson on Gen Con TV. Our guest today is Mike Selinker. On this show, we go in search of the untold stories behind your favorite games. And this season, that's Dungeons and Dragons. Um, in addition to serving as a creative director for Dungeons and Dragons, our guest is a puzzle maker, has published uh, puzzles for New York Times and Chicago Tribune. He is a game designer with such titles as Betrayal, House on the Hill, Axes and Allies, Risk, the Pathfinder Adventure Card Game, and one of my favorites, Lords of Vegas. And he is an entrepreneur, founder, and chief creative officer at Lone Shark Games. Mike Selinker, thank you for joining us today. Hello. I'm excited that you just gave me credit for designing Risk. Well, it's Risk. I, you know, I didn't get the full title. It was Risk, uh, what was it? Godstorm. Risk, uh, Godstorm. God, Godspell? Yeah, I, way back in 1954, <laughs> I thought, hmm, what if people could take armies and fight each other? I know. I get the same thing like with Gen Con. Somebody will say, hey, you founded Gen Con. Go, <laughs> you founded Gen yeah. Con. Yes. Yeah, let's see. I was born in 1961. The first Gen Con was 1967. So I was six years old. Entrepreneur. <laughs> Peter Entrepreneur Atkinson. right from the beginning. No, of course not. Anybody listening, don't be confused. Gary Gygax started Gen Con several years before he published Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, it was a war game before role playing existed, before magic, card game, well, training card games. It was a war game. That's show, not I true. It's not, I mean, there was Stratomatic Baseball. It's not a trading card game. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. I, I, I did amend from card game to trading card game really quickly there. Yeah. <laughs> sure. And sure. trading card game would capitalize TM. Patentable. <laughs> it's patentable. It's not that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let us not rob any glory from our dear friend, Mr. Certainly. Garfield, the good Certainly. doctor. Certainly yes, not. yes, yes. All right, Mike, uh, we uh, on the show, you know, we, uh, well, this is all about you. Uh, let's start with. Where were you born and raised? Like, where are you this, from? This city uh, right here, Seattle, Washington. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm an original. I, uh, I um, was, you know, I grew up on Capitol Hill. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, my... Um, Have you of, always lived in Seattle? I mean, did you ever move away for a while? No, I moved away. Well, that's that's how I got it. I mean, so... So yeah, am I jumping? I mean, am I jumping ahead of the story here? Yeah, no. So so first the first the glaciers cooled, uh, and then no. Uh, so no. Um, I was born here. I, I went to you know whatever school here and such. But um, I got, <laughs> whatever school you don't remember yeah, one <laughs> Garfield High School. Thank you very much. Oh, right. um, and uh, but the important thing is that I was given uh, a copy of the, the Dungeons and Dragons. Specifically, this copy of Dungeons and Dragons. That's the same one that I learned from. That's right. That, yeah. Yes, the blue cover with the Quasquaton dungeon, I think, was inside. Yeah, something like yeah, that. Something I like that. With, with all these magical pools and everything like that. Yeah, that sounds right. I yeah, guess. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I remember That's... learning the words gelatinous cube from this yes. this book, and and you know I was hooked. Right. So so yeah. So uh, I was given this uh, by my mom's boyfriend. Who okay. didn't know quite what it was, but thought I would able to be able to figure it out. And, and, and about when was that? This was 1979. Oh, same year I got into it. You and I yeah. are both late. We were you, we were both latecomers, weren't we? That's, I I guess. Well, we weren't from the Midwest, right? Yeah. I mean, like That's in the true. Midwest, That's you true. got it. You got it two years earlier, right? I right. Mean, they, they, right. And, and by the way, <laughs> in this world of Amazon and and stuff like that, people probably don't understand why I think geog geography might matter. It literally was because the people who published the game would only drive so far to drop <laughs> right. off copies to game stores, you know, hobby stores right. that mostly sold model trains, right? right. And right. they they wouldn't drive out to Seattle. <laughs> no. <laughs> right <laughs> crazy talk uh, <laughs> so, yeah okay dungeons and dragons, dungeons and dragons didn't get on a plane until 1979 <laughs> fat tech there were trucks and delivery service yeah okay okay oh, they really, but I mean, for a while they were doing it out of their you know out of well, the but yeah and 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 the games you know uh you know i bought my dungeons and dragons at a model train store yeah exactly exactly yeah yeah um, yeah okay so you were a fan of D, &D from 1978 yeah about that so um yeah oh, by the way, i got my got my gen card oh out. yeah 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 good good yeah 
exactly. Um, yep. By the way, I got to ask you, because uh, I didn't last time. Uh, this this logo here, yeah, right. This yeah. Chaldea. Yeah. What what is this character? Because uh, that's like a th in Greek. <laughs> Or something. Oh, it's the E in Chaldea. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, sure. Uh-huh. Anyway, <laughs> totally with you. Anyway, um, mm. so so yeah, so I um uh I did that. I I played the game. I had um this is going back. So I had a yeah. basement. Uh it was kind of weird. So I lived in a house and I lived in the basement. Now that sounds really dark, right? Yeah. But yeah. but what it meant was I had this sort of little three-room apartment of my own. Oh yeah. Uh, and yeah. I had so I had a little bedroom, I had my music room, and then I had this sort of big room with a big table in it. And at the chair at the end of the table, I had two airplane chairs. Right? Air, air, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, so there were airplane, airplane chairs, chairs yes. blue airplane yeah. chairs, mm-hmm. you right, know, they right. even had the the uh cigarette holders or you know, the ashtrays and stuff. And so right. and and I would sit in this, and you have to remember that I'm like 12 right right but i'm sitting in these chairs and my friends are like around this really large table um and we're like playing dungeons and dragons and i mean we felt for the first time in our lives that we were like you know powerful people right right we're right. adults we you know whatever and so so yeah i ran i ran that game uh uh for my friends um i i uh and very quickly i said i looked at it and i went you know this is good but i could write this you know that that was the that was the thing about D that that it, it inspired so many of us yeah. to to want to add to it you know why or, or, or I change it i hate <laughs> to say this because uh, you know i the gary gygax was a good friend of mine um you know we did a lot of things together but i'm gonna say this it may not have been the most well-written thing because (laughs) because people like me at age 13 could imagine themselves doing it like if he had like written it you know and it was unapproachably difficult to write material like that maybe we wouldn't have found it so inspiring I, I but, yeah, I think there was a lot of like, oh, this is great, but I gotta fix it. <laughs> I gotta do it. Yeah, I got. I gotta be the person, right? I gotta make right, my own right. version of it. And yeah, so, and I think it started. I but I think that also came out of wargaming and uh, so much of what yeah. role playing was. The idea that you're the dungeon master and that you can uh, that you are empowered by the game to do exactly that. It changed your frame of mind. It changed Absolutely. your mindset from. Uh, from playing a game where there's a board and there's pieces and you follow the rules to a game where you make up your own rules. Oh, I get to make up my own rules? Well, okay, let's start here. I'm going to make up a whole bunch of rules. And they gave you a place to do it, which was kind of interesting. So, like, back then, Dungeon Magazine, I'm sorry, Dragon Magazine, um, Polyhedron, later Dungeon Magazine, uh, uh, and there were also other publications like White Dwarf and, and things like that. If you had something to write, they were desperate yeah. to get it, right? So, yeah. So, so how does this lead into you having you know, having a career in this well, business? Well, I mean, basically, I put myself through college doing it, um, doing writing. Uh, so, I wrote various uh, things for the um, for Dragon and for the RPGA, and uh, you know, I got. Um, so, so what did you do? Did you just write? Did you just write in and say, yeah. "Hey, I got this article." No, that's for what you. I'm saying. Is and, I, yeah. I, I just did it i was like i was 15 years old yeah and i just went you know i can do this and i wrote i think the first thing i did was a like maybe a crossword puzzle but pretty quickly thereafter i was writing full uh full modules full adventure modules um i did a bunch for polyhedron uh i did a bunch for dragon um i think i did the last the very last adventure that was in dragon magazine before dungeon launched and then i was in like the so, first couple issues so of dungeon if you were in college and you started with 12 so you were this was probably in the late 80s by the time you were yeah dead. so like uh yeah. i left high I, I i moved to chicago which was also it wasn't planned but it was incredibly uh uh fortunate that i moved to chicago for college because 
I then got to play in the campaigns of everybody. I would go to La Lake Geneva because um, it was a, a just a little bus ride away. And I played in Skip Williams's campaign and Penny, Penny Menser's uh, and um, uh, John, with John Pickens and with, with uh, I played with Gary Gygax. I played with, I played with everyone, awesome. right? And awesome. so, and at the time I was just sort of this, you know, I was a kid, right? Was, right. At this point I was 18. Um, but I already knew that I could, like I already had the bona fides of having been published by these people. So, oh my god! So they, I, I, I'm feeling embarrassed that my initial email was to you was like, Mike, I I feel like maybe you've done something with D and D, but I'm not <laughs> sure. Should, should you be on my show yeah, yeah. talking about D and D? I, uh, and you're like, you stupid idiot, Peter. Of course you don't. I don't think I said that. <laughs> I, I rather very, this wasn't the nice. time. This wasn't the time I said that. Yeah, this, not this time. Right, right. Okay, I'm going to get confused with all those other times. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, we did work together after all. <laughs> That's so, right. Um, so, so, so you got to play with all those guys back yeah. in the day. You know, Skip, by the way, Skip Williams is going to be my guest next week. Oh, and, and you cannot do better. Uh, the Sage himself. Oh, right? I love Skip. I love yeah. Skip. He's just calm, mellow. He's, deals, the, he's the best. He's a, he's a good guy. Yeah. He's the best. So, so yeah, so I did that. Um, and you put I, yourself through college writing adventure models. Yes, for adventures, um, pretty much. I had no idea you went to college. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know how, uh, <laughs> there's one of my favorite jokes is, um, do you know how um, you know if somebody went to Northwestern University? They'll tell you. They'll tell you. I just told you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so, yeah, I um uh i i did that i i, I was a full-time journalist but uh and i i did a lot of serious reporting and 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 uh work on things like hate crime legislation and, and all sorts of things like that like i did real serious stuff but the more serious stuff i did the more dungeons and dragons i wanted to write yeah yeah right because the more i wanted to be like you know in my spare hours i'm like this and then you called right i mean so so i did i did all sorts of things freelance for a while the first um uh, i managed to grab a ton of my stuff from downstairs the first thing i did freelance i think was so the first sort of thing i remember being in is this it's called the port of raven's bluff tilt that you know glare tilt it slightly forward there you, yeah, go. There you go okay perfect so the port, port, of port of raven's bluff, raven's was, bluff. Like, was a forgotten realms accessory and yeah. they're like, do you want to be in a a a, um, a published accessory? And I'm like, uh, I don't know, sure. And then they started asking me to be, you know, contribute to a whole bunch of others. Um, so I did that for a while. Um, I also, you know, started to design board games and things like that, but didn't really have an outlet for it. Um, now, now, and, and before we get to the my call, so. Um, I, I don't want to divert from D and D too much, but sure. you're probably you know one of the things very interesting about you, especially vis-a-vis -vis other game designers, is that you're also a puzzle guy, and yeah. you've done you've had puzzles published like New York Times, Chicago Tribune. How, how did that happen? Like just well, briefly, actually happened, like, it might have even happened first because you know um, w when you're talking about doing something like a dungeon module, it's a big thing. It's a multi month process of thinking it out and playing it and and there's not very many slots for it uh, in whatever needs to be published so it was a big deal to do that but you can knock out a puzzle i can knock out a puzzle in a you know in a half a day and so i started making crossword puzzles and things like that when i was 13 and i sent them into the new york times and the games magazine and stuff like that and they started publishing them immediately and they didn't ask how wow. old i was and I, and no, like, it, it, you were 13 when you got your first puzzle published. I think, my, I, think yeah. I might have been. I think I might have tried a little bit first, so I'm going to guess I was actually maybe 14, 14 or 15. 15. Something like, that. Uh, well, like still, I think I had some rejection along yeah, the way, yeah, right? Yeah. Because I had to get better at it. But, it's before they before they discovered Will Shorts, right? And had uh, Will Shorts <laughs> was the first person to actually publish my stuff. Are you serious? Yeah, he was. He was like 20. Was he a nice? Is it was he a nice guy? I guess I gotta ask. At that point, think. yeah. I mean, he's always been a nice guy, but yeah. I mean, he was he was he was great. He uh, he and and those people, um, the the sort of you know the Gary Gygax's of D and D that the 
the equivalents are 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 Will Shorts and Mike Shank and and uh, Emily Cox and Henry Rathbone on the puzzle side, and they they all just nurtured me once they figured out I was a kid, which didn't take long because they could read right. my letters, and they were like, <laughs> I don't know, wait, hold on, how old are you really? <laughs> and I was like, written in um, written in 20, pencil. <laughs> I'm twenty. I'm twenty eight. Yeah, uh-huh. right. Sure. Okay, <laughs> right. okay, that's great. Okay, well, I just had to ask that. Let's let's no, no, we'll, fine. We'll go back. So, but we'll but that was the way I got in. Yeah. But that was the way yeah. I got into Dragon, too. Right. Well, I mean, was, that's really interesting. I mean, it's almost like the Mark Rosewater story, right? I mean, he. Yeah, I, I mean, there was more to it, but he started writing those puzzles for the Duelist for yeah. Magic: The Gathering, and pretty soon, and that's how he. Yeah. Because he, he's filling this niche that people go for. The thing of writing an adventure novel or adventure right they go for the big but, thing but uh like you know go for something that nobody else has thought of that's good and that's also good. you can do a lot of them which is kind of nice because it's like the new york times needs 365 and a quarter puzzles every year right, right. and right. so you know i mean your odds are pretty good that if your puzzle is right good you can get it in right and so anyway that was true about the the adventures on the D D side as well and i just i just kept doing it i just kept so who, who were you um who did you work when you were doing that um not to dwell on this too long but okay. um uh we when you were sending in uh stuff to tsr let's say um who were who was answering your mail who were you talking to on the other uh the first person um Oh, um, probably was Frank Menser. Okay, yeah, maybe maybe Penny, now sure. Penny Williams, previously Penny Menser. Um, yeah. uh, soon after that, it was Gene Raby, uh, yeah. who's another uh-huh. wonderful human being. Uh, yeah. These are also there's something kind of important about these people too, in that they're incredibly nurturing people. Right, right. right. No. They weren't they weren't jerks. Right. This has go. been a, a recurring theme, Mike, yeah. uh, in interviewing um, any of the people that came out from TSR to Wizards of the Coast, uh, Monty Cook, um, mm-hmm. Bruce Cordell, uh, you know, Sean Reynolds, uh, everybody I've had on the show from, from who came out from Lake Geneva has said the same thing that, you know, the, the horror stories you hear about TSR were all the upper management people yes. that, you know, and not the, the, and I, that probably contributed i think they, they've speculated not my not my opinion they've speculated that that contributed to a very tight-knit uh feeling of camaraderie amongst the staff and a nurturing yeah. like like we're all in this together we got right together. i i never saw that level i mean i knew all those people i knew the people who were at the top level um i knew jim ward i knew all those folks but i never saw it um because i was dealing with the the rank and file on a daily basis and right. yeah and so uh, I just really came, and we were playing games together all the time. And so it just wasn't going to be difficult, right? Right, uh, right. And then, you know, um, when I had to start actually paying bills, um, I I suddenly was like, you know, I'm doing a full-time job. I'm doing, uh, I worked for the city of Chicago for a while for Mayor Daly. Um, I did, uh, I did. You know a lot of a lot of serious journalism stuff, and and I'm real proud of that. I won a bunch of awards. Oh, that's uh, great! And then I just was like, man, this is hard. And I see the arc of what a journalist in Chicago looks like when they're 45, yeah. right? And they're like, they all smoke cigars and they're all like drinking under the table. And I'm like, I don't want this for myself. And so I, I want to drink. I want my drink right here on the table. I want a Gary Gygax skull mug is what I want. <laughs> uh, so, uh, which I now have, thanks to Luke Craig. But, uh, but uh, that's a different story. But, um, uh, although I could tell the story of when I met Gary Gygax, if you want that. Story. Yes, of course. Tell the okay. story when you met All right, Larry, I'll tell that. Uh, Gary I'll, I'll try, Gygax. There are longer versions <laughs> of this story online. So, so if you like it, if you want to hear the whole story, go 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 look up vodka skull mug on the internet but but basically um i was one of the young writers of dungeons and dragons so at this point i'm successful at this um Mm -hmm. and i'm just getting ready to go out to chicago i'm 17 years old and they fly me out for a young writers conference at which i meet lisa stevens um and so um 
we go out there and I'm sitting at the table. Uh, Penny is welcome to stand. It's eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, it's a very long table in a conference room. And, uh, and I'm sitting, uh, if this is the head of the table, I'm sitting right here, right next to the head of the table. Right and, on the, and, and this is at the TSR office? At the Lake TSR Lake. office, yeah. The old Q-tip factory. Yeah, yep. sorry. So we've been driven to Lake Geneva. We sit there, you know, the first thing is that, and Penny says, uh, so the first thing we're going to do, young writers, is um, uh, have Gary Gygax talk to you. And the door swings open like a saloon door in a uh, Western. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and this burly man comes through, Gary Gygax, you know, we think of him maybe from his later photos, but at the time he was a giant and he bursts through the door and he goes, young writers, let me tell you about uh, how to write the greatest stories ever told. And he sits down, it's eight o'clock in the morning, sits down, slams a vodka skull mug on the table. I mean that by, it's a skull mug. And I realize it's not filled with water, it's filled with vodka. And I'm like, that's what I wanna be when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he wasn't drinking under the table. He no, I know. On top he, of the this table. This was an industry where you could drink on the table at 8 o'clock in the morning. And I was like, yeah, that's me. Oh, my God. And so so we became fast friends from that. Uh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Uh, and, that's a great and, that's a great story yeah so there's a longer version of it which is probably yeah funny. yeah all right but, but anyway so yeah so i got to meet all these people and and i never wanted to work in lake geneva that's really important i just was like you know i'm a chicago I'm a city kid i want to be in chicago i want to be in seattle that's it i don't want to be in some podunk town in wisconsin that's not yeah. me. um so flash forward to 19 uh what is it 95 um you call um yeah so yeah. you're thinking dungeons and dragons is neat i want one and uh, <laughs> and so so you're like you know pretty you, much it yeah that's exactly pretty much so, it yeah so you you flew me and a few other people out uh and we met for the first time and you pitched me on this vision of of creating a, a you know a, a, a company where um, there were RPG designers and card game designers and they worked really closely together and there were events team designers and and that it was instead of like you know uh, this siloed operation you know there was all sorts of free flowing and I'm like oh man this sounds pretty good yeah so okay not all of it came true but okay well <laughs> the, the time, there was there were some people some people uh some parts of it came true um, yeah good, enough of good. it how about how about enough of it came true um, i'll take that i'll yeah, take that enough of it came true yeah. you weren't lying yeah. right. Um, so right. uh, so but uh, you know so we get out there i start making all sorts of things i start working on both rpgs and card games and, guys... and and we by the way you came with uh yeah. Taylor, so, right so Taylor woodruff Tim and, Beach, Wolfgang Bauer. And okay, Tim Beach. We were yeah. we were a, a tightly knit unit. Right. Um, and we weren't gonna get broken up. We were either gonna come as a group or we weren't gonna come. Right. Uh, that was a, possibly one of the weirdest interviews I can imagine you've ever been in. Where you're like, <laughs> see this wall of people in front of you and are like, well, if you want one of us, you want all of us, or you get none of us. Yeah, I I uh I, I remember that and I respected that. Like I was like, okay, these guys um first of all what i liked about it was like okay these people these four people like each other well enough that they're willing to you know be you know brinksmanship a little bit to, yeah a little bit um uh to to stand by this idea and uh you know what kind of a jerk would i be if i tried to to break it up and but that means that they believe that they work together really well yeah. and I mean, they complement could... each other well and, yeah. and you know you always worry about how people will fit into a team if you hire somebody one off right right so we just brought yeah. the team yeah um, and then we got to work with a person who i'm sure you if you haven't had on here i'm sure you have will uh which is jonathan tweet oh yes yeah. well yeah i have to admit jonathan was the first person uh yes of course uh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, one, so, one of the one of the first people i uh I yes. reached out so to. i mean um so jonathan's my favorite game designer in the world um just simply the best i, I have it, ever met 
I would have to loop him, lump him uh, with Scaff and Richard. But yeah, yeah. I yeah, mean, I love, yeah, I love yeah. both those guys. Yep. I love both those guys. But I mean, if I have to, like, if we're, if we're building a Mount Rushmore, you know, yeah. we'll, we'll put four people on there. If we're yeah, building yeah, yeah. a Mount Rushmore with one head, it's Jonathan Tweet. Right, right. Also, don't build Mount Rushmore with one head. That's that's gross and fascist. Um, so, um, so anyway, the, um, that would be the beginnings of a totalitarian game yeah, designer that's, state. That's terrible. Don't do that. <laughs> yes, so, yes. Um, so, uh, but um, but no, Jonathan. I was like, I get to work with this guy, right? And he wasn't right. this guy yet, but I knew it when I met him, right? And I was just like you and I were going to do some things together. And, and we did like, we made some really good stuff together. And right. so um, I got to work, but simultaneously I got to work with Richard very closely. I got to work with Scaff, obviously I got to work with the rest of the magic team, um, you know, Jim Lynn. And, 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 and so what, what did you work on? Let's, let's talk yeah. about what you worked on before it became D before you right. started working on D. &D. Uh, well, the first thing we did Bri was briefly, and then we'll get yeah. to D. &D. First yeah. thing we did was try unsuccessfully to make a role-playing game out of magic together. One of many attempts at that process, um, which yeah. has only actually come to fruition in the last couple of years. Um, yeah. And I, I, I think they could have done more. Well, let's, I mean, yeah. it was a complicated, yeah. complex. Oh, Mike, you've war, stepped war. into it now. You have stepped into it. I, 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 at the risk of repeating uh, what I've said from uh, prior shows, um, yeah, it's one of my big regrets. Yeah. Of, well, uh, it's that, one of mine that, too. That, that, that we could not get, um, even after we had Dungeons and Dragons, you know, when it was clearly clearly the right yeah. thing to do um nobody hardly anybody agreed with us you know? well you and i yeah so what we had was basically people who believed that working simultaneously with another group helped the other group more than it helped them yeah and yeah. that uh is a flaw in uh maybe maybe in the 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 selection of those people right yeah. um but we were not able to make it happen. Uh, but it wasn't the only thing I was working on. I was also um, in helping with, uh, I helped do, I helped launch Netrunner. Um, I helped yeah. with um, uh, with uh, Battletech. Uh, other card games on, in that line uh, worked very closely again with Richard, but also with some really good friends like Paul Peterson. Oh, yes. Uh, and, uh, and, and Sean Carnes and just a great group, Glenn Elliott. Um, all great people. And so, uh, and then my team was the Black Lotus team, which was me, uh, Tim had moved on, but me and um, Taylor and Wolf and Kids Johnson. Uh, right. And Kids yes. Kids Johnson. I haven't and, heard her uh, name in a while. And we made, we were like this powerhouse storytelling team that could just go, yeah, okay, you need something, you need a world designed. Okay, we can do that by Thursday. Right. And so right. we would do that. Um, and then uh, uh, you had the the idea that um, maybe uh, maybe maybe a less intrepid man would have done <laughs> wouldn't have done, but you said, you know, I'll bet I can go get Dungeons and Dragons with this group, and uh, and I was like, you can, <laughs> and, and I don't know how like. You and I talked a little bit about it, but it happened so fast um, that I, I I barely remember. So I remember that it, the, the news went down on April 1st, which was a terrible day to launch a big announcement uh, inside a company, right? <laughs> so I, nobody I knew like it outside, that sort of thing. <laughs> no, nobody knew it outside the company, right? But my phone, so you and I had had some conversations about it and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Pete, it'll never happen, whatever. And I went back right. to work, right? Um, but then my phone blows up, uh, and I think the first call I got was from Dave Eckleberry, um, yeah. the co-writer yeah. of mine. TS, uh, TSR guy that we yeah, brought yeah, out. Yeah. Young guy yeah, at the He time. was like, Mike, I'm hearing things. And I'm like, yeah, uh, I think Peter's out there now. <laughs> <laughs> but he hasn't, like, you had just gotten, you had literally left the night before, right? Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I was like, yeah, he didn't tell me specifically that he was going to do this, 
but he did not tell me that either. Right. <laughs> right? So, so like you had sort of primed it, but you hadn't ever stated it directly. Yeah. That, well, that Wizards was acquiring TSR. I mean, you have to, yeah. you know, you're, you're in this, you're, you're, you end up in this um, phase where you need to talk about it with people right. unofficially, you know, right. to start, because you have to start making plans. Like, what here's, would this look like? And here's what I remember. All, all that. Yeah, please. Here's what I remember. You asked me what it would be like to own TSR on a sort of structural level without ever saying you were doing it. Like you were just like hypothetically, Mike. Right. If you had to look at the the structure of TSR, what would you change? Right. Right. Like not not I need to think about what I'm going to do when I get TSR, but in a fantasy world, right? right? We're just right. talking. Right. We're just talking. We're just guys right. Right. talking right. here. Right. If you had to like think about what you would change about TSR to avoid making the same mistakes again, what would you do? And I'm right. like, well, and I'm dumb enough to start just spewing this and not say, <laughs> why are you asking me this question? <laughs> so anyway, I, I do figure it out at you're, this point. You're you much, you're, yeah, yeah, you're much more suspicious now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so when Dave calls me, I'm like, yeah, I think he's out there now. And uh, and so the thing goes down. Uh, as far as I know, you and Ryan are out there only. Uh, well, the, well, could... the first few trips were just me uh, alone. Okay. Uh, but uh, Ryan, I mean, and then I brought in different people for different pieces yeah, yeah. of well, it. Well, this was, uh, this, this Ryan, was your... Ryan. I don't know. Ryan might have been on the first trip. It uh, was the first. He, um, it was definitely the first trip. And so, yeah, and yeah, because Ryan really brought me the deal. You know, yeah. this deal. You know, I. You know, <laughs> Ryan's a colorful character. We all. We're going to talk about him in a second. Yeah, yeah. So, but, uh, uh, you so, know, I, I will always owe Ryan a debt for bringing me the TSR deal. That's right. So, yeah. so anyway, so it goes down, um, and you fly back, um, and this is one of my favorite. Con- I've had hundreds of conversations with you. This is my favorite conversation we've ever had. Um, so you fly back and you call me into your office like that day uh, or maybe the next day or whatever. And and I said, so you did it? He said, yeah. He said, yeah, okay, I did it. Okay, great. All right. So who can't come? And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, you know who is not allowed to come to this company, but I don't. Who can't come? And I'm like, oh, God. And literally, we went through every single employee in the building uh, that I knew. I didn't know everybody, but I knew. Yeah. 40. I knew like yeah. 40 people. Right. Uh, of, and right. you knew like 10 of them. Right. Right. And I was like, okay, we're going to go person by person. And we started with the really great ones. Right. Let, let me tell you about Cindy Rice. Yeah. Right. Cindy you Rice, know. Skip Williams. Yeah. Skip let me Mohan. tell you about, yeah. let me tell you about yeah. Skip Williams. Yeah. Let me tell you about, right. And, uh, and we went through and like, and you're like, God, these people all sound great. I think this was a great, and then we started and it got darker and darker and darker as we went down the list. And I'm like, and then no, and then no, and then no. <laughs> <laughs> and we, you and I together, I'm sure you had many conversations like this. I'm not saying I was the only one, but, but I remember in that conversation, you took incredibly good notes and we, and that version of the company, the version that I would have, if I were running TSR, would still be there. You literally brought into the door a month later. Ooh, huh. glad this boy, glad this has a happy ending. Was- yeah, no, I mean, all the people, all the people who came were gems. Yeah, every yeah, single one. I, some, of them had a, some of them had a harder time dealing with Wizards culture than than sure. Sure. others. Right. Um, but but uh, they also had me to deal with. So that was the other element, right? Was that yeah. you said to me, I need you, like, I need you to, to be part of this. I need you to, to be in this division. Because I'm like, you're bringing out TSR. You, it's a functional unit. What do you need me for? Like, oh, I don't know, man. I just know that this isn't going to be right if there isn't people who've been in the wizard's culture as part of this organization. Yeah. I know you said that to SCAF and, and a few other people, right? And some of us had, but so you pulled me out of the card game side. Uh, and the only way you got me to say yes was you gave me Spider Man. 
So they had the <laughs> they had the the Marvel license, right? Because right. I'd done Dungeons and Dragons. I'm like, you know, whatever. And it's like, yeah, but we have Spider Man, and you you could be in charge of that. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm in. And so. <laughs> So I came over, um, <laughs> and then once you were in, we dropped it, right? Yeah, <laughs> but, well, but I, that, that took a little longer than that. That okay, sentence. Yeah. We 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 I worked on that game for like two years, but we produced the Marvel Superheroes Adventure game, and it was great, and right. everybody loved it. I got so many good stories out of that. And but but the but really quickly, um, I became uh, a very different voice, I think, than I was on the card game side. So on the card game side. I was the guy who understood story, right? Uh, I could design right. cards. Uh, um, I wasn't the best card game designer. I mean, I was I was good, but I wasn't like, you know. Well, you had you had really tough competition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't I mean. Charlie Catino, right? <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't Bill Rose. Yeah. I wasn't Mark right. Rosewater, right? I was I was good. I could do I could hold my own, but not at their level, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, but I understood story better than they did. And so they could they could go okay well, so this is what we want to do what happens I'm like oh this happens right and so and I also kind of was one of the guys who really nailed flavor text and I could sort of do that so so okay I'm doing that right um, and that's my role over there and then you pull me over to um, to the R, uh, to the RPG side and all of a sudden I'm the math guy <laughs> I'm the guy <laughs> who understands like everybody else is like. I guess probability works like this. And I'm like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, first thing we're going to do is like, we have the first, first meeting. And I say, so what do you want to do? Right. On, on third edition Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and I say, well, if you do nothing but make armor class go the other direction, you have done the Lord's work. That was my first <laughs> sentence to the TSR team. And they were like, we like you, you get to stay. And so You're you, you know this this topic of of um, merging the cultures of wizards and TSR yeah. and um, and it was one of the most complex sort of social things I had to do in terms of trying to to watch my words and be careful what I said and still communicate a point, which was this idea that I felt that um, what I felt I'm going to say this fact the wizards R and D team was incredibly good at hardcore technical game design and but not at story and mm -hmm. the tsr group was the opposite mm -hmm. and well and the tsr group knew D and knew the t and D customer base really well and and uh, knew a lot about publishing dungeons and dragons and, and campaign settings but they weren't the best uh, technical game designers and so mm -hmm. trying to kind of gently figure out how to say that without saying it and and figure out how to try and address the issues structurally um uh was uh, a challenge but i think we did it you know this might be the first time that anyone has referred to putting me into a situation as gentle <laughs> <laughs> but well but, it's it's gentle but, it's gentle as compared to how you how one could approach right these topics, exactly right I mean, right well, i mean you you know it's like yeah. you know the the other example is putting jonathan tweet on the third edition design team and then yeah. eventually having him run the design team that's, that's right. not a gentle move but it's a structural move right. but you do it with kindness and with you know come on guys let's you know well let's, yeah let's and i have, think let's, i think, let's, I think the, you know what what better come you know yeah you can't do better than i mean see, here's the thing we uh, when I came in, I was the guy who probably could handle the hardcore math of it better than anybody, but I wasn't alone. Jonathan could do it. Monty could do it. They, you know, they, they, there were people who could handle it and, and we needed like organizing principles. And so, um, you know, I, I took on the position, um, that you know the the there's a hippocratic way to redo to reboot dungeons and dragons right which is we do no harm we we change what we need to change to make it like we produced it today but people will recognize everything in it um but from second edition you know we'll put the demons back in but whatever it'll it'll basically be 
a, a, a soft reboot, right? Right. And then there's another position which I articulated, which was the um, the you know a much more brutalist approach, which was we're going to say that Dungeons and Dragons is a great game and not look at it again. We're going to design the game from the point of we all know how to play it, but it's over there. Right. And we're going to redo it from scratch. And I felt that, you know, we had these, we had a fairly big team um, that I was, since I wasn't the person who had to do it, um, since Monty and Jonathan and, and Skip were going to actually write it, that I could say stuff like that and not have a stake in it. Yeah. Whereas they would have, you know, especially when Scaff was on the team, uh, they they would have really serious fights over yeah. over these things, and I could, for want of a better term, I could just sort of say, well, here's the outcome of that taken if you actually do it, and here's the outcome of this if you actually do it, and neither of them are wrong, but we should have organizing principles. And so that's when Bill Slavisek gave me the um, control of, uh, he made me the creative director of the introductory product line. Um, right. So that's this set. Yes, yes, yes. I remember that product. Fantastic product, by the way. Yeah. So, uh, and Ed Stark was the person who started it, and Andy Collins. Like, I we I don't want to paint myself as being essential to this project. What I want to say is that I was, uh, I had a, I had a bit of a hand on a t part of the tiller. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. That is a better way to yeah. phrase it. It's like there were some really strong egos in the room. They were all trying to do things to make the product line better, and I could say, okay, okay, but over here. And right. so, um, so I, and for, for whatever reason, that was the, the thing that people thought was the most, one of the more important things was, how are we going to introduce people to this? So um, uh, one of the things we instituted that TSR had never done, that I'm aware of anyway, I could be wrong, um, is focus group testing. Now, focus group mm -hmm. testing is not necessarily all the sexiest thing in the world, but, but I just wanted to see, uh, Jonathan especially and I wanted to see what it looked like when we put these things into practice in front of people who weren't 28-year-old, 35-year-old game designers. Because for some right. reason, there was a culture of, if we like it, it's great. Right. And I was like, that is not how game design works. You are not you are not buying all of your product. If you can commit to buying fifty thousand of these tomorrow, then you get to vote. But right, right. the customers get to vote with their money, and I'm gonna make a game for them. And so, um, so we we one of my favorite focus group tests we ever did was this first test of that box where um, we had some kids come in, and there's a unicorn in the um, in the thing, and it's asleep. And so in a dungeon room, and you're like, okay, well, what do we do? And the kids walk in, okay, well, I want to wake up the unicorn. Okay, well, what do you want to do to wake up the unicorn? Well, I, 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 I pat it, and it doesn't wake up. Well, I talk to it. Well, it doesn't wake up. I stab it with my sword. And behind the glass, everybody's jaw drops. and went, <laughs> what? <laughs> and the person running the game says, well, that doesn't work either. And they go, okay, well, then... Um, I look around the room and I go, oh, holy cow, they're button mashing. They're basically just taking their Xbox controller and, oh, <laughs> right, and just right, hitting right. it to see what, what pops up, right? right? And eventually they find the chalice in the room with the potion that gets the unicorn to wake up. But it didn't matter. The dungeon master who was running it, who wasn't a professional game designer at all, knew better than to describe the gout of blood that would fly out of the unicorn's throat when it was stabbed by the kid, right? Right, Instead, right. Instead, they just went with whatever the kids wanted to do. And right. we had a number of people behind us, and I was like, this, this is how you do game design. And right. so I think that that's, that culture that, that 
Jonathan and, and a number of us tried to implement of no seriously, you don't just write it down and then play it with your friends once. You, right. you put it through the paces. Really made for the greatest RPG release of all time. Um, I got something out of it that I don't think a lot of people have seen. Um, so we made you know, what I think is the most, the best selling RPG product ever. Maybe. Well, I I don't. I think that was true for a while. At least um, at the I, time. Yeah, I think that now the franchise is bigger, Wizards is bigger. Yeah, maybe. So I'm sure fifth edition is. But here's something that but, doesn't uh, exist but, on most copies. I don't know if you can see this. That's I my name. Uh, I got a gold embossed version of the book with my name on it. <laughs> right. So even if I forget I was there, this book is going to remind me for the rest of my life that. I was part of a pretty amazing team that made an excellent RPG. That's and awesome. I was really proud That's to awesome. be a part of it. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Hey, uh, I want to go back. We have a, 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 a person, Lefko Scott, who's been saying some really nice, kind things about our show on, on oh, chat. Oh, I haven't been looking and, at chat. And, and, I'm sorry. Well, that's okay. That's my job. I, I, I talk to you and look at this at the same time without anybody noticing, but you can't really sure. do that. Uh, so um, uh, he going clear back to the magic and D&D or magic and RPG uh, combo, he, he mentioned um, that he was, it was mystifying that that took 20 years um, for, for this to happen. And I thought I would just add one comment about that period, because I mean, we never really explained why it didn't happen. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think fundamentally, at the end of the day, it was that, and I don't want to paint sort of wizards at the time as, as being too siloed and it, there being a lot of antagonism. I, it wasn't, it was just a, a tiny bit of that. It was a, that really at the end of the day, the magic team didn't want to have a D and D magic supplement and the D and D team didn't really want to have a magic gathering D and D supplement. Right. There were, there was, I gotta tell uh, you what, I'm gonna give you my answer to the question. And yeah. I don't, I don't care who knows it. The reason yeah. it didn't happen was because there wasn't enough women in the room. Oh. It was a bunch of rutting male, uh, you know, uh, both game designers and brand managers who were too caught up in themselves to uh, to ever let uh, someone else succeed on their watch. Hmm. And yeah. if you'd had a more, if, I say you, but if we'd yeah. had a more diverse group of um, creatives on and, and and brand people on both sides, I think we would have rammed that that project. Through. Yeah, but I think our answers are complementary. You're you're saying why is because yeah. uh, lack of diversity or some stubbornness and um and and I I yeah. you know I, I I remember somebody from the Magic team coming up and saying, well, these are the Magic the Gathering brand values, you know, and you know that lottery ticket feeling and et cetera et cetera and um and you know D D and D is just not that and um I don't know, man. Like, sometimes uh, when you just make ten, sometimes making 10 million dollars is enough yeah. right i mean sometimes yeah, so. just making the thing that everybody buys is enough yeah and yeah it's all right. i i'm not i i i will it's like it's like i'm not bitter about it it's just like i'm not uh, bitter about like, it either. but it's like oh man i've so wanted that project to happen and i, I remember conversations with you and with scaff and jonathan about what we could do and and how it would be so much fun and I think oh, that oh, you know, I think that oh. the people making the D and D brand decisions were not Magic players, and the people making the Magic brand decisions were not D and D players. And yeah. so you had a you, me, Scaff, Tailwind, uh, you know, a, a few a few people who really were that midsection right. of we yeah. like both these things. We like country and western. And, um, and Richard, by the way, was in that group too. But it oh was yeah, just well, Richard that, wasn't. But, it, it was, it was, there was a lot of, it, it was just there, it, it was at the management level. It was yeah. at the mid tier level that was like, that, that was just like, okay, this has been totally blocked, you know? So, yeah. Oh, well, I, I think hey, that's, we that's tried awesome. it. And, 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 you know, it might have, in fairness, it might have been the wrong time to do that because there were fears Maybe. at that time that D and D was going to become like Magic the Gathering and Magic or, you know, or something that, that there was one of the concerns about Wizards acquiring TSR was that we were going to make it some sort of collectible. Right. We were, That's you know, right. There, that we would, that there, that we would. There were some fears that were uh, legitimate fears that we would not have done, but it might have been the wrong time. But 
So, I don't know. Hey, we spent I, a lot of time. We spent a lot of time getting incredibly pricey licenses for Dungeons and Dragons, all of which I made. Um, <laughs> but but it, the license that would have been cheapest to get was the one across the hall. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I feel like that. I feel like. But anyway, you know, like I said, I'm not. I I I, I don't think back and say. I wish I had succeeded in that element of my career. I right. think of it more like that was the way I got to work with all of these really cool people. And they wanted to keep working with me because I had shown a lot of skill on that project. Um, and so it's, it's not a, it's not a, it's, it's a speed bump. Right. right? It's, right. It's, it's, it's not something now the Harry Potter RPG, that I feel very personally offended about. When we did a we did a version of Dungeons and Dragons for Harry Potter that would have killed, and uh, and you know Warner Brothers and J.K. Rowling weren't given. Well, it's not important why it didn't happen. The important thing is that it didn't happen, and that would have that I actually resent because that was a personal project of mine. Right. Um, so, but. So before we wrap, before we go to kind of the yeah. end segment, I, I want to ask you one one sort of question, uh, sort of one of these uh, esoteric sort of touchy feely questions. Um, you know, when you think back at your t on your time working with Dungeons and Dragons, what what have you taken with you from that period? Well, I mean, Dungeons and Dragons is the most powerful influence on me, other than my parents, without any question. Like, uh, I'm a storyteller. I'm a um, I'm a I'm a public speaker. Uh, because of it, I'm a, um, uh, I, I know how to run, I know how to understand people better because of it. I'm probably a really good poker player because of it. Like it's affected every aspect of my life. And so, um, and the fact that Dungeons and Dragons is now cool means that I was also kind of willing to do something that turns out to be a pretty good life choice as well. I think it's isn't it cool that D and D is cool now? Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting that um, it's actually kind of in a post cool phase. Like now it's just part of the culture. Like for a while, so it was like that. That's what really what I meant. I, I yeah. isn't it isn't it cool that D and D is part of American culture now? Yeah, right, exactly. Like yeah, I think they, I think when we put out when we put out third edition, it started getting cool again. Yeah. But then it just sort of became like Settlers of Catan or or games like that, where it's just like, yeah, that's those are games people play, you know, like Dungeons and Dragons. And no, like you can say that sentence completely flatly now. And right. nobody yeah. nobody even blinks. So yeah, I, I think it's been um for me, it's been a really good ride. I've continued since I left Wizards in 2003. Um, we helped launch uh, acquisitions inc we did all the set design for that in fact my favorite thing that i ever did for dungeons and dragons isn't in a product it isn't in a um you know it isn't in a magazine it isn't anything like that it's the time we dropped a 30 foot version of the idol of uh from the from the player's handbook cover on a stage at pax right <laughs> and <laughs> the video of that still exists on the internet it is you know it's it's acquisitions inc idol drop you can look for it and you know i took that and i just said well, let's just do it we had matt smith make it and it it was the greatest moment to see that thing 30 feet tall wow and uh so you know we've helped with wizards since then with well, lots of and, other things and, and by the way that's a that's a great segue so uh, you know we have just a few minutes left uh, sure. what what do you want to tell us about your life since then and, and what you what are you doing these days what what well, what so is mike selling her in 2020 yeah. aside from social distancing uh, you know it's not that much different than my regular job uh, so uh i uh i own a company called lone shark games uh it is uh the publishers <clears throat> of things like the maze of games apocrypha um we made the uh, pathfinder adventure card game we we uh help bring back Betrayal at House on the Hill. We did all the things that, uh, you can go to our site. We have a massive sale going called our Save Our Sanity sale. Um, so if you go to loansharkgames.com and click on the store, the shop link, uh, you can get all of our stuff at 
50% off or more because we know these are tough times for people and we want people to have our games, which are really good solo games, uh, and things like that. So you can get the ninth what, world. What's your, what are your top sellers? Top sellers are the maze of games, which is a, uh, puzzle novel. Um, uh, uh, there's, um, Apocrypha, which is our horror game that's a follow-up to the Pathfinder adventure card game. The Ninth World, which is a game I did with Monty Cook. Uh, so he and I kept working together after that, that nice. time on D&D. Uh, and then Thornwatch, which is uh, something we did with Penny Arcade. Uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, you can get all those games for more than 50% off uh, because we really want to get them in people's hands while this is a tough time for folks. Uh, the other thing we're doing is that we just recently... Um, regained the rights to a game we put out 10 years ago called Lords of Vegas, which you mentioned. Lords of Vegas. Show. I love that game. Thank I you. love that game. I played it twice this year. Uh, it's a great game. You and James did that, right? That's James right. Dennis? So James yeah. and I did yeah. it. We did it through Mayfair and eventually made its way into Asmodee's hands. We just got uh, rights to it back. We're doing a Kickstarter starting Tuesday uh, called the Lords of Vegas 10th Anniversary Underworld and Boss Bundle Campaign. Uh, you can find oh, it's gonna have all... like expansions, like yeah, new brand stuff new expansion, oh, uh, brand new expansion wow. called Underworld, uh, which awesome. introduces mobsters to the game, which is gonna be great. Uh, and um, uh, we're gonna do that. Uh, you can go to loansharkgames.com/slash Vegas and sign up for to be notified when the campaign goes live. And if you want to nice, see the game, nice. if you've never heard of it, uh, but you think it sounds cool because Peter and I like it, um, go back uh, a couple weeks in the Gen Con TV vault and you can see uh, us playing it live on camera with, um, and, and it's, it's <coughs> um, uh, uh, what's the name of the show that we're on? After Dark? Uh uh, we're, we're on the show. No, no, no. We're on Gen Con TV. This is Fireside with Peter Atkins. No, 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 no. Sorry, the show we did it on. The, uh, game night. Know. Thank you. Game I... night. That's the words I was looking for. Yes, game night. So go know. watch the game night broadcast of that. Game night. Yes, it says if a voice just appeared in my ear. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, and it's on Gen Con video. Gen Con video. Okay, on, on YouTube. Yeah, yes. that's the channel. Yeah. And so it's great. It was a very fun game. Um and uh and so but you, you know you know what I, I just gotta say you know you know what I love one thing I love about that game Lord uh, Lord Hold of on. Vegas say your thing yeah yeah, yeah. what's that huh? say your what? thing I'm gonna get a copy of it you're not gonna go to the bathroom are you no 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 I'm just gonna show a picture of it. <laughs> oh yeah yeah so, okay so so the thing I love about this game is that in true Vegas style it actually in at moments in the game the right decision is to go gamble. Right, which I mean, okay, I mean like that, and and first of all, a brilliant stroke of genius, or uh, whether that was intentional or, or accident. Let's say intentional. I'm sure uh, to design a game that has these moments where, like, oh, you know what's the best thing to do right now is to go gamble. Yeah, right. and and even though the odds are against me winning, it's the right thing to do in this that's moment. Right. And that's I think awesome. that's true about life. I think that you know <laughs> sometimes you just got to go gamble. Sometimes you got to go to Vegas, baby. That's right. So we're really excited about this, bringing it back. Um, you'll be able to get it again. Most people haven't been able to get it, haven't been able to get the up expansion. Uh, and our <clears> new <throat> expansion, which we're going to fund through this campaign. Uh, so again, go to loansharkgames.com slash Vegas. Yep. And you can sign up and we would love to have you because it's going to be great. Great, great. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, this is fun. Thank you. Well, this uh, this wraps up another episode of Fireside with Peter Atkinson. Um, our guest next week, by the way, will be Skip Williams. Uh, the in the sage. meantime, yeah, the sage. I know, I can't wait. Uh, in the meantime, uh, stick around on Gen Con TV. We have the Westgate, your regulars, local authors playing deity in their worlds at 6.30 p.m. tonight. Uh, Friday at 2 p.m., table takes, 3.30, roundtable discussions. Uh, Monday, 6 p.m., board games with the Brothers Murph. Next Wednesday at 9 a.m., Minis with the Murphs. And um, 11 a.m., board games with This Game Gets Dicey. And then at 4 o'clock, uh, back to me with, uh, with Skip Williams. Um, also, check out our podcast for this series, Fireside with Peter Atkinson. Uh, this week's Fireside release will be on Friday podcast. Uh, the archives of the History of Magic uh, releases I did in the previous two seasons 
um, also come out on Monday at podcast. Um, so please remember to follow or subscribe and turn on your notifications for the channel. Uh, if you miss a show, you can find all of our streams on YouTube just one day later. And so thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Mike, for being our guest. Thanks to our technical director, Marcus Mays, our streaming manager, Lauren Bond, our producer, Derek Guter, and thanks to Gen Con TV for streaming us. And thank you for watching.